This week we look at Peter. Father, we just want to ask that you would take this time to direct us into your heart. That we could face the issues that are ours. That we could face the issues that are others with the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that is ours. And so I just would pray that as you apply this word to our heart, that you would direct us after yourself, that we would indeed follow Jesus with a great and a pure devotion. So I'm just asking that you would teach through me as I speak today that we might follow Jesus more closely. Amen. Peter has denied his Savior. And he did that during the trial. He then was crucified. What a, what a guilt. It says he went out and he wept bitterly when he realized that exactly what God had said was going to happen is exactly what had happened. And, you know, we don't like it when people tell us, I told you so. <laughs> no one perhaps said that to Peter, but he knew it on the inside. But now his Savior has risen from the dead. Jesus has more to reveal to him about who he is. He always does. Isn't that right? Is that you have not come to that spot where we've explored the, the depth and the breadth of all that Christ wants for you to know. But sometimes, the way he does it in our life can be very difficult for us. And he asked Peter some questions that <clears throat> I don't think I'd have been very comfortable with that morning. I don't think Peter was. But are you open to self-examination? Are you open to the correction that he may want to bring into your life? Because when he works that way, it doesn't feel good at the moment. But God's doing a work. Amen? Amen? So, so if we believe that, then we, then we want to open it up. So turn, if you would, to John 21. And today's account is going to reveal this following Jesus in this fresh way. We're calling it following Jesus with devotion. And he gives us a couple clues that <clears throat> provide us some hope, some direction, that um, for those who make mistakes, you know, so there's only a couple of you that are here that are working in that realm, but just in case you know that that's who I'm talking to, you're those of you who make mistakes. But is it dedication or is it devotion? Which is it? Jesus wants you to understand more than you do. But if you think you know, as it says in Corinthians, you don't really yet know what you ought to know. And so there is a continual exposing us to truth. So turn with me, if we would, to, to John 21, verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Canaan at Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two others of Jesus' disciples were together. And Simon said to them, I am going fishing. And they said, we will also come with you. And they went out, and they got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So the disciples said to them, children, you don't have any fish, do you? And they answered, no. And he said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find a catch. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. 
and the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging a net full of fish. So when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire fire was already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Thomas does not miss this manifestation. (laughs) I'm not saying, you know, I I don't see him showing up in the fishing stories earlier. That was James and John, Peter and Andrew. But these guys are going fishing. Tom says, I'm hanging with you guys, (laughs) okay? And um, I think before the morning is over, the night may not have been a lot of fun, but uh, he joins them. So they have this lousy night of fishing, zero Fish. Now, to some of you, you know, hey, a, a bad day fishing is better than a good day working. You've seen that on bumper stickers around there. But to them, fishing was work. This was how they provided for their family. So a lousy day fishing means your family has no income. In all likelihood, people sometimes have picked on Peter while well, he went back to fishing. Well, guess how the income flow was going after Jesus had died? You know, they'd been living in this support basis with Christ, and, and people were making these donations, and, and their support was going on, and I'm guessing, you heard that, guessing, but there was an income. And Peter, being a logical person, says, hey, it's time to do something for my family. He had a family, and so he went fishing. And someone was there on the shore. It was Christ. And Christ is seeking to give them direction. And the first thing he has to do is show them the condition that they are in. We don't like that sometimes. Jesus wants to show you where you are so he can lead you to where you could be. But he starts with a question. Children, you do not have any fish, do you? Did he know? Oh, yeah. God always knows. When God asks questions, he's not seeking information. He's wanting to give information. He's wanting to reveal things to us. And so Jesus is speaking to them. They don't yet know it's Christ, but he is already speaking into their life. And he said, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find a catch. If you remember back in the day, a couple of years before this exact experience had happened. Very similar to it, where they had spent a night, nothing had been caught. Peter was there fishing, mending the nets, and Jesus says, hey, send out, put down your nets for a catch. So John instantly sees it, and Peter <laughs> jumps overboard. I think it's a great story. I, I haven't found any bad ones. There's some of them that I don't enjoy as much that are in the Bible, but you know, You know, following Jesus is yielding control of our life by obeying his directions. What he tells you to do may not make sense to you. It may not fit the patterns of behavior which you have operated by in your life. Their habits was fishing on a certain side of the boat. But he's going to speak into your life, and it will require change. Have you ever noticed that? that every time he, he, he comes along, it's like, okay, there's something else he wants to deal with in my life. And I, I'm not trying to shame. It's just a normal question, but that question reveals a need. Do you have any fish? Now, see, someone standing on the shore, just like if you've ever been to, to the harbor, I, I go over here to Crescent City, and, and I've picked fresh fish right off the ship as it, as it comes into harbor. You just go up, hey, you guys got anything else? Do you have any crab? Do you have any? And, and we'll pick it right up, up off a boat. And, and they would certainly do that in their day as well. So the idea is saying, hey, you guys have any fish? And Jesus already knew. So he says, oh, do you have any fish? He said, no, we don't. Do you know how great your need is? Do you know how much you need the Lord to work? 
If you're going to find God's provision, you have to come to the place where you admit you need his provision, all right? And so there's a great spot there, but we're at that place, and you may be there this morning, at a place of need, a place of desperation, a place of pain, maybe a place of panic. <laughs> but something I've found, and it's interesting how many times it shows up in the Bible as well, and it certainly does here, is that we often have to fail before we release control. We think we can handle it. I've got this, God. <laughs> no, we don't. But it takes a while for us to figure this out. Jesus had asked Peter, hey, would you be the guy that would spend this night with me in, in prayer? Oh, man, I, I, I'm here for you. <laughs> Sleeping away. Hey, it's easy to find fault with that guy. I have fallen asleep on my knees a bunch of times. There is actually one of the best ways to fall asleep. But you're trying to do a job, and yet you're not where you thought you were. But you thought... I will never deny you. I will never fall. I won't. I don't care if everybody else does. I'm going for it with God. Ever met that kind of person? Ever been that kind of person? The Bible says in Psalms 46:10, "Cease striving, and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. I will be exalted among the nations." Cease. Striving. For me, taking the sabbatical was actually some difficultness. <laughs> Not working. When, when that is what drives you, that's part of your motivation. But I have to look up and say, okay, wh what is it that he wants me to do? And the disciples were not recognizing Jesus yet. But the results instantly reminded John, that's Jesus. He said, it's the Lord. He, he, he knows on the spot, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter hears that it's the Lord, he, he throws his cloak back on. We, we say, why, why would you do that when you're going to jump in the river? But if you realize he wasn't showing up at his masters in his tidies, and... Uh, so he puts his cloak on, and he throws himself into the sea. It says about 100 yards away. So he, he swims to shore. You ever think about that? You go, why didn't Peter just stay in the boat, help the guys get to shore with her? You're going to be there in 100 yards. You say, nope, I got to be there now. Peter's one of those guys. He, he just, you know, he had a size nine and a half mouth and he wore a size nine and a half shoe. He just said, say things and do things that consistently brought him trouble. But one thing is amazing about Peter is he loved his Savior and he wanted to be with him. And so as soon as he realizes it's Jesus, what's he there? He's going for it. He's going for it. Are you wanting to be closer to God? I sometimes offend people, so that's my disclaimer. <laughs> You're as close to God as you choose to be. As the book says, if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. That, that, that's a choice that you make. He says, my, my sheep, in John 10, 27, he, he said something about this character of how we relate to him as the master, John 10, 27. He says, my, read it with me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They will make a response. They'll hear my voice, they'll make a response. Following Jesus is yielding control of your life by obeying his directions. We, we have our own plans. Have you ever noticed that his don't fit yours? Some of the stuff that you've had to been through, some of the stuff that I've been through, it's like, if you knew your future, you wouldn't want to go there. You wouldn't want to be going through what you've been through. Certainly the disciples wouldn't want it to have. 
But yet it was God's plan. So can we look at these situations that we're going through that are oftentimes painful in our life, difficult in our life, and say, can I trust him? You know, we just a couple weeks back, we're talking about not grumbling or disputing, you know. And then the next week, my wife found a, a wristband in my drawer that she was cleaning out and says, quit complaining. <laughs> so so I, put it, I put it on. I have no idea why it's there, but, you know, just in case. But to be right, can I trust him in his work, in, his li- in, in, in my life? But it says this in verse 9. This is, I find these stories fascinating. It says, when they got to land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish on it and bread. Okay. We're having somebody talking about charcoal. Hey, charcoal does not instantly light, does not instantly provide. That's why they've done gas, right? Because it takes a while. Jesus had a place and a meal prepared for them before they ever came to him. Isn't it amazing to think about? If Jesus had planned this whole encounter out, the question is, do you think he showed up at the local fish market? Or do you think he just made fish come? Interesting thought. He doesn't tell us. But for those of you who do want to know, God does like barbecue. Okay, I know there's astute observation. Some of you had to see that this morning. And he also is not vegetarian. He does eat fish but, um, and lamb. But he says to them, come and have breakfast. Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. How many fish have they caught? This is 153. By whose help? <laughs> they got nothing. But God provided, and it's an interesting thing, God will use what you can do with him to do what he wants to do in your life. But it's an interesting thing that Jesus wants to be closer to you. He's willing to spend time with you. It, it said when we did our study way back when, in Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm waiting for people who are willing to take the time to be with me. And I will come in and sup with him and he with me. He said there in John 14, he says, if you'll walk this out, me and my father will come and live in relationship with you. That's a whole issue of abiding. Will you take the time to be with Christ? Because we serve a risen Savior, amen? So he's alive. He's with you. He'll never forsake you. So the question is, are, are you spending time with him? And you say, James, I'm so busy. I, are you so busy that you have time for Jesus? I mean, we would never say that. You know, I, I, I just can't do... I've said this before. <laughs> I'll probably say it again. No Bible, no breakfast. And some of you that aren't into, Bible, aren't into breakfast don't care. But the issue is that you start your day with God. And you say, hey, I am going to seek him first, just like his word commanded me. And for me, breakfast is a big deal. So I love my breakfast. And if you want to build a better relationship with anyone, what does it take? It takes time. It takes conversation. And so he, he then moves into this set of questions. And Jesus is not stuttering He's teaching. When God repeats himself, he's wanting to make a point, all right? And understand what he's not doing in these next things. You'll see it very clearly. He's not rejecting Peter. He is not shaming Peter. He's not blaming Peter. He's not guilting Peter. But in yet in this conversation, if you've made some of the mistakes that Peter made and you're asked the questions that Jesus is about to ask him, <clears throat> it's a good chance you're going to feel some of those things, but that's not what he's doing. He's inviting him to a different place. Let's continue on. Verse 15, it says, When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love him. You And he said, shepherd, my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to them, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of the sheep. Following Jesus is something that is motivated by his love for us and our love for him. Duty will not carry you very far in the kingdom of God. It'll make you very tired, make you frustrated. We know that God has demonstrated his love for us. We have a cross. God demonstrated his love for us. So so we are known that we are loved. I, I don't know what pain you've been through, but I can still tell you that you are loved. See, people will sometimes look at their life and say, well, God doesn't love me because... And then there's this event that they then interpret because of the difficulty of life or the pain of life. No, nothing that you've been through ever changes the cross. God in his timing and his wisdom will explain this to us in our, in his time. But he says, do you love me? And he starts off his first question. Each of these questions is slightly different. He says, more than these. Now, the different grammar guys have went in here, and, and they can't necessarily agree, so I, I won't be emphatic. They can be one of two things. What do you mean more than these? The fish or the disciples? Because fish had been a big part of Peter's life, and when he was called to follow Christ, he says, hey, from now on, you're going to be catching men. Just leave this fish behind. And so they left their nets, and they followed him. So some have taken this. Are you going to leave this and come with me? But also, that night in the upper room, and he said, even though everybody else will fall away, I won't. Which is saying what? Go ahead. Think about it. What's it saying? I love you more than them. I don't don't care about them. I, I, I am the most faithful guy here. Fortunately, I haven't met too many people that say that about themselves, but yet we sometimes think that about ourselves. I can't go to that church anymore that does this, or I can't go to this and this, or that person does it. We compare ourselves. Our pride can get us in a lot of trouble. Pride goes before a fall. We, we know what the scriptures say. Why do we not rip that stuff out of our life? But he says something here. So besides the question that he asks, he said to him, Lord, you know that I love you. you. You know that I love you. And he says, then take care of my lambs. My lambs. Jesus cares about his own. And Jesus cares for you. He knows the pain you're going through. He knows the difficulties of your situation. He, he knows how frustrated you are with the life that you currently are in. He, he says, I want you to take care of these. But he says an interesting thing. When he says, tend my lambs, he says, also, you belong to him. It's his sheep. And, and so there's this marvelous statement. But then he says to them a second time. He said, Simon, son of John... Do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. So now he comes in again and says, if, if you love me, this is James's translation, you will do this. You love me? Then, then take care of people. There is, there's an, a natural relationship that affection for Christ will produce in us a service for others, that if you love God, you're going to love other people. John talks about this in 1 John. You might do some reading there on your own. But in more than one place, he says, many people will say they love God. But if you hate your brother, what's God say? You're a liar. (laughs) Nice, subtle way God has of putting himself. He says, you're lying to yourself. Because how can you love God who you haven't seen and you won't love the one he's made says, no, if you, if you love me, then you're going to love people. 
2 Corinthians 5.14 tells us something that I think is just great for us to, to meditate on and review I want us to look at that verse, 2 Corinthians 5.14. Read it with me. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he goes on to say, and those who died, that they should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Everybody says, this is what struck me, just the thought of the love controls us. Why do you do what you do? Because of the love of Christ. It, it has to be that it's compelling. We don't serve to earn favor. We serve because we received his favor. His love has already been given. But he's asking him a question, do you love me? Why? You have to go back to the original but in the original, Jesus says to you, they, they have a much better, more detailed language in the Greek than, than we have in English. When we say love, we love chocolate, we love our dog, we love a sunset, you love your wife, you love your savior, and you love those flicks on TV. Really? Love? It's the same word, but they had like six or seven Three or four were their formal. And, and Jesus is saying here, do you agape me? Have you made this unconditional, committed choice to say, I'm yours. I, I'm, I'm loving you. I'm devoted to you. And each time Peter says, I phileo you, as in, I think of you very closely as a friend. They're not saying the same thing to each other. So he says it again. Peter says, I care for you as a friend. But if you know what Jesus has already said to them in John 15, he says, greater love has no one than this than he laid down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. So, so there is this, this level that Jesus is trying, and he often does this with us. He says, you love me? This is good. Do you? What do you mean, do I? Of course I do. No. He's wanting you to see there is more that can be done. There is more love that can come out of you if I drink it in from you. Because we love because he, what? First loved us. So, so I have an endless supply of love. Tell the person next to you, you have an endless supply of love. Go ahead. Tell the person next to you. They may need to hear it. All right. Some of you need to tell that person next to you. Okay. But you're like, I don't want to tell that person that because then they feel like I'm trying to guilt trip them. I, the issue is not the person that you're loving. People can be very, very difficult. But the issue is the person who loves you. He gives me enough love to love difficult people. Now, whether I choose to draw from that well or I go to my own flesh, it depends on the day of I'm walking in the Spirit, right? But that issue that he loves us, he wants us to, to, to drink from that well. He wants us to take this in. And if he were to say to you, do, do you agape me? And, and if, if Peter's going to be honest, Peter probably should say no. But he just uses his Greek and says, no, I think of you as a close friend. I, I, I find... See, see, we can be coy with God. We're actually just being coy with ourselves because he knows. The only person we're deceiving is ourself. Okay. But he says what? Yes. Yeah. So we come and we sing these songs. We tell God this is true about us. And yet, really? He's a shepherd, my sheep. If your faith is in him, you're his. You, you belong. If you love him, then you'll serve him, all right? If you love me, you will serve sheep. Serving doesn't make you saved, <laughs> but it is a sign that you have been saved. It's who you're serving, all right? And, uh, you know, 
it can be difficult. So now Jesus has demonstrated his love for mankind prior to the cross. Healings, miracles. He, he's showing his provision for them. These guys' boat was going under. He says, hey, just be quiet. <laughs> the ocean stops instantly. It was washing over their boat. It just stops. And they're like, who is this? <laughs> Do you know that he loves you, but he took it all the way to the, to the cross? But Peter is then asked a third time, do you love me? Two things happen here. It says he was grieved because he said to him a third time. And we just look at the third time and we go, ding, three denials, three questions. That had to be some correlation but in the original language, there's also, do you even phileo me? Do you like me? Do you really think I'm being your friend? Is that really, are you, are you even? And then Peter says something very interesting in his response. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. But the night in which he denied the Lord, what did he tell Jesus? You don't know what you're talking about. I don't know if you see this this way, but I do. I've got a twisted mind. He's telling God, you're a liar. I won't ever. He's telling Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know me. Does Jesus know you? Who? Have, have you met you occasionally? You know, you look in that mirror, you know. I used to have a friend say, say that mirror scares me down. <laughs> I still feel like I'm 16 until I come look in that mirror and I go, ooh, man, what happened to that person? But he says, you know all things. Do you understand? That this is James's perception. But I think the scriptures back it up. That Peter had to go think that thing through. He, he, he screwed up. But, but his Savior told him he was going to screw up. So, so he knew. In fact, he even said, when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. So when you, he knew he was going to walk away, but he also knew he was going to come back. Can, do, you, do you believe that God keeps you, that God has a plan for you, even if you screwed up your life, even if you've done stuff that he said never, never do? Can you turn around and say, you know all things. You know everything about my life, and you still love me. The Bible says, take heed when, when you think you can stand. He says, can you humbly, do you think, man, I am zealous for God, I am going for it. You're, it's a hard thing, even as preacher people, people tell me, oh man, I am never going to do that again. Oh, please, don't tell me that. You, know, you just laid the, the, the groundwork for the next thing you're going to make a mistake in. I never want to do that again. Great, I, I am fine, but say, I will never, no. I'm going to be dependent upon the Lord to keep me. Humility is the only way we can walk with consistency with God. Otherwise, pride will just deceive us. But he says to him a third time, he says, tend my sheep. If you love Jesus, you will love those he loves. Some of you have been blessed with the, the blessing of having children, and some of you have grandchildren, and some of you have great grandchildren. I don't know if any of you have great greats, but in that spot, isn't there an amazing thing is how much love you feel for that child and how much love you feel for your niece or, or your nephew or different one. What did they do to earn that? <laughs> it just comes flowing out. Because right? they're part of your family. It's just if you recognize that your brothers and sisters are part of your family, he says, you'll become a person who'll tend to their needs. 
And love is essential for serving people. <laughs> Commonly called by Jesus, sheep. And I could have Pete come up and tell us why you got to be really loving to take care of sheep. But, you know, it's a common thing that sheep are known for being a little foolish, shall we say. But they're also known for the fact that they stink. Okay, if you've ever been around sheep very long, they can stink. Not only that, they can bite, <laughs> they can wander, they can headbutt, and they can pick on each other. That be you is what your Savior said, your sheep. He says, and if we're going to love one another, he says, we, we have to step into a world, you have to be a part of a church, you're going to be a part of a family that's going to have what? Other imperfect sheep in it. And, and you're shepherded by a sheep. <laughs> I, I'd be someone who's walking this out as well. Now listen, you will overwork if you try to do this for God, but if you do this from God, it becomes overflow. If I am so loved by him, that I will overflow towards him. It doesn't mean you don't get exhausted. <laughs> but it means you're motivated. That's what keeps you going. And he wraps up here, he says, it's really too late to say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and you'll bring you where you do not wish to go. And he said this signifying what kind of death by which he'd glorify God. And when he'd spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. And Peter, <laughs> he is so like us. He turns around. He saw the disciple whom Jesus loved falling down, the one whom leaned back on his own bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Oh, man, Peter just had it served to him right there, man, just right back in his face. But, you know, following Jesus necessitates a, a daily surrender of our will to him. Is that what he says? What's he telling Peter? You're going to die the death of a martyr. You said you've got this. You're going to do, they're going to take you away. This is exactly what he said. But only devotion will lead to submission. Duty will fail you. You're just being a faithful guy. It's going to fail you. It's love that will keep you going. It's knowing that you're loved and that I have his love. See, we, we think of life, we look at this, and with Peter's, Peter sees John. Here's John just hanging out behind him, just trying to eavesdrop. Oh, what's, what's this conversation going down between Jesus and Peter? I'd love to be a part of that. He says, what about this guy? And we have a tendency to look in our lives and think, if God is God and he is just and he is righteous, then he'll treat everybody the same. That's not how he works. That's our system. That's the way we think. He doesn't treat everybody the same. Some of you have experienced horrific pain in your life, and others have not. Some of you have through tremendous difficulty and physical suffering, and others have not. And we look at that and say, well, what about this person or what about that person? <laughs> if I can use Jesus' words here, what is that to you? You follow me. See, the issue is not about what anybody else is experiencing. The issue is about what he has already experienced for you, and he's invited you to pick up your cross and follow me. He said, yes, sir, I will. But, what, but, what? You know, I was raised with five brothers and sisters. I have no idea how my mother lived through that. But you're always, but their piece is bigger. They're touching me in the back seat or what? <laughs> you're always got to complain against somebody else in the family. And the fact of the matter is, there's some really irritating people in the body of Christ. I have been labeled as such by many people, all right? But submission to who Christ accepts his plan regardless of the cost. He says, what's that to you? You follow me. If I want him to remain until I come. Wait a minute. Do you understand? I don't get to go there, but there is a whole bunch of truth. Who decides how long you live? 
We've just been through a pandemic and people have been panicking. How do I keep myself alive? You are kept alive by the power of the Spirit of God. He's already set your date. You've got an expiration date posted on you. He knows when he's bringing you home. You're his. But listen, it's not because it was fair. It was not because it was easy. It's not because it was attractive. But it's his will for you. That's the way we have to take it. The only way to follow Jesus is to keep your eyes on Jesus. If you still lock, start looking at the people around you, sometimes they can be really encouraging, and other times they're not. It's his call to dedication and obedience and loyalty. It says, daily surrender. is the words I used. The action of yielding one's person, giving possession or power to another person. So whatever you want to do, Lord, I'm yours. Then God can do something. It says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that this, this is exactly what he's saying. These verses that many of you have memorized, if you haven't, I'd encourage you to. Read it with me. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. What is it going to say? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Good, acceptable, and perfect does not mean easy, comfortable, or without pain. Sorry to mess up your American mindset there, but... The fact is, is he, he, it's good, it's acceptable, it's perfect. It is the perfect will of God. And he says, I want you to be involved in serving sheep. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your gifts are. They all work together. There's one body, and there's many parts. He says, I've made this for you. Your love is to motivate you to keep serving Christ. It's not what you're facing. It's who you're looking at that keeps you going. It's who you're looking at. Listen, servants are the greatest. You are sitting in the comfort of a building that was built debt-free by most of you, by people who you've never met. In the building next door was built debt-free by people here. In the building before that, the log cabin that burned down in 49. But there were people who have been faithful to God, who looked at Jesus and said, he's enough, who made provision for you. The lady who taught Sunday school for 50 years in this church. 50 years? Yeah. People have served on the mission field for years, decades upon decades, 50 years of ministry. One that were retiring. Are you doing what you're doing because you're loyal or because you're loving? I'm here to tell you, my loyalty runs out, <laughs> but his love never does. Amen? So Jesus' followers are motivated by love to serve others, surrendered to him. It's not sentiment. It's service. He has given us himself. Let's come to him. Lord, we stand amazed at what you have done. And we want to follow you. That's exactly what you told Peter. It didn't matter what he did, how bad he'd screwed up. He said one thing, follow me. Don't look at everybody else. Just follow me. We want to do that. Man, we find it so easy to get distracted by what people do, what they don't do. We get distracted by ourselves and how bad we've messed up, and you come, and you don't say why. You just say, do you love me? So we're to come today and say, we do love you. We, we want to make that choice to love you with a commitment that seeks your good above our own. 
and then display it in the way that we love other people. We find ourselves often being good friends in the testing days that are yet ahead of us, we ask, will you produce the agapo, love of God in us, for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the healing of his family. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and just sing a song about his presence. If you love him, you love his presence. Some of you have been watching. Notice that we've got a, a door open again. We did a baptism yesterday. A lady about 80-something was baptized.